make sure everything is working all right. We're sure excited to have everybody here today. It's a good group. I'm sure we're going to have some more folks hop on. Um, important topic important topic. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction. Jamie's going to say a few more things, and then we're going to get going. We're going to talk about ambiguous and anticipatory grief. Really look at what are those two things, because if you work in the field of caregiving, or if you're a family caregiver, you most definitely are going to relate to both of these. But there's another type of grief as well, and it's called collective grief. And as a nation right now, and as a nation for the last couple of years, we've been in what's called collective grief. It's where a large group of people are going through grief at the same time. Many times we don't even realize that's what it is. We've all been going through grief because we've been going through loss. We've been going through the loss of our normal. Our normal was taken away. And we grieve that and people grieve it in different ways. We've seen it over the last couple of years, but we're going to do this as it relates more to dementia. But I did want to just kind of throw that out there as well, that we've all been in this state of collective loss, collective grief, add to that being a caregiver or care partner of somebody who has dementia. So grieving the loss of what used to be and realizing that some of it is never coming back is going to be part of what we talk about. All right, Jamie, did you want to um, just briefly talk about the West Center? Yes. Um, so some of you may not know the James L. West Center. We are a not-for-profit organization here in Fort Worth, and we serve persons impacted by dementia. And we do that through a variety of services. Um, one of those is your education that we are doing today. And this is um, uh, part of our charitable gift back to the community, our education we do for families and professionals. We also have our residential care. So we have a community here close to downtown Fort Worth where we serve um, persons that need more long-term care in our building. And then we and we can do respite stay as well. And we also have our day program, our senior day program. Um, we're um, excited to announce that we are going to be opening a separate campus for our day program. We'll be able to serve more participants, but they can come during the day, um, get the care and the activities and the social interaction that's going to um, be great for their whole person well-being, and then get to stay at home longer. And please. Uh, Call us for any um, any questions you may have education wise, but if you're in the area or you just want to say, hey, I would like to know what James Elwes looks like, or I want to learn more about that day program, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here anytime to answer those questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. All right, let's get going. Here's my information. Uh, many of you already uh, know me because you are part of our education programs or our support groups. You heard Jamie mention earlier, we're getting ready to do our Dealing with Dementia course with the Rosalind Carter Institute. Today is Rosalind Carter's 95th birthday. For those of you who do not know that, still active, still working. She's not going into her office at Georgia Southwest, but she is most definitely still overseeing the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving in um, Georgia. So we are trained, we, uh, Jamie and I are master trainers. Uh, we are trained through the Rosalind Carter Institute and it's one of our favorite programs to get to do. So uh, hope that you can be part of that. That one's on August 29th. Here's our objectives for today. Those of you that are getting your CEUs, I know you've got to have your objectives, but let's jump right in. You are getting copies of these slides again. And let's talk about that word grief. So many times when we hear the word grief, the first thing that most people think of is they will associate that with death. Grief is associated with loss. Grief is the loss. And it's the loss of something or someone. And it's very natural for us. As a matter of fact, as a licensed professional counselor and as a grief therapist, I would be much more worried about somebody who wasn't going through and having the um, emotion that are connected to loss that many of you as family members and even as professional caregivers are having. So th that question I get asked so many times is what I'm doing normal is what I'm feeling normal course it is. It's normal for you and everybody's grief can look very, very different. So again, grief is not always just with death, it's with loss. And so as caregivers, 
uh, people who have dementia, we're actually going through grief throughout the entire process. And it starts with the very first time that we even thought about or considered this might be dementia. If you know anything about grief, if you've studied grief at all, if you go all the way back to the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross model, and she talks about denial, that first time that we thought, could it be dementia? No, 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 no. It can't be. They must just be getting older. I bet they need new hearing aids. I'm betting they need some new glasses. We had all these other reasons for what we hoped it would be. But we grieve lots of things throughout our life. We grieve, just like I just mentioned, collective grief that we've all been a part of. We're grieving the loss of our normal right now. We are still in this. So if you've heard me say, we're not to new normal yet. This is still messy middle. We're on the other side of messy middle, but we're not quite to new normal. I don't believe we are. We can grieve loss of relationships, loss of dreams, jobs, houses. We grieve the loss of many things. Now, grief is different from sadness because sadness is that actual feeling. And sadness is that feeling of sorrow or even being unhappy. But grief, grief's that ache, that dull ache. And it can show up and take over when we least expect it. And we'll talk about some examples this morning. Walking through the grocery store. And here come the tears. Where did that come from? Watching something on TV. Hallmark commercials. And all of a sudden, that grief comes like a wave and knocks us down. Grief is really easy to understand if you think of it like, kind of like the ocean. There's times that we're standing right there in that water and it is so peaceful and clear that it looks like glass and everything is great and fine and we're okay. And there's times that there's just some little ripples and waves and we got to plant our feet, but we're, we're standing. And there's times that it knocks us down. And we're doing everything that we can to keep our nose above water. It's all grief. Tears oftentimes take the place of words with grief. And tears are an act of love. And tears can be very, very healing. We live in a um, society, though, that we tend to always want to hide those tears instead of just letting them come sometimes. And there's many times we just need to let those tears come. So let's look at the word loss and what are, again, some things that we lose. A divorce is a loss. We can lose a home, a business, a pet. That is a very real loss when we lose our pets. Banks, rupsy, bankruptcy, repossessions, and the loss of our normal. There's actually an exercise that you can do, and I've got a support group that meets on the second Saturday of every month, and early in that group last year, we went through and we did this grief exercise, and it's where I ask everybody to just go back, take some time, sit with your loss, and start to list all of the different losses you've had throughout your life, and I had some people end up making spreadsheets on this, including myself. Because we start thinking back to all the many different things that we've lost. Parents divorced. We moved when I was eight. My grandfather passed when I was seven. You know, and we start listing the losses. And then we make another column. And it's, how did I cope? Did I talk about it? Was I told not to talk about it? And then how did the adults, especially for the loss in our life when we were young, what did I see others do to cope? Did I see people drink? Did I see people get mad? Did I see people eat? And so you can start to follow your grief and loss patterns. And sometimes you can really connect some dots and go, that was a learned pattern. It was a learned coping skill that I either, either then overcome as an adult, or maybe I haven't. 
and I need to learn some better coping skills. But it's a great exercise to do. It can be a little bit hard. And most people will kind of leave it out on the desk for a while because you'll keep coming back to it because you'll continue to remember. My best friend moved away when I was 14 and the loss that I went through by losing my friend. I encourage you to do that. And it's, it's a great way to look at how you have been able to get through loss throughout your life. And then we have that word bereavement. Bereavement is the actual action or the condition of loss, and it's that period of mourning. But please hear this. There is no period. There is no time limit to mourning. The only time there's going to be when we get concerned about time is when someone is uh, in complicated grief. And we're going to talk about what is complicated grief in just a little bit. But the bereavement time is that time where we're going through that adjustment period of living with the loss. It's the time where we are figuring out and we're realizing, okay, that loss was real and that loss was permanent. That's the bereavement time. It's the process of working through, okay, that really happened. And I'm still here and I've got to find a way to live with this loss. It's a normal process after loss and it has a name. It's called bereavement. And I thought this was so powerful. There's nothing more difficult than grieving the loss of a loved one who is still alive. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing when we have a loved one who has dementia. We're losing them a little bit at a time. I want you to take a look at this picture. And what was the first thing that you saw? There's one of two choices there. Some of you are going, well, it's a rabbit. And other people are saying, no, it's a duck. And if you look at it, it's both. It's a rabbit and it's a duck. So what is ambiguous grief? Ambiguity is just being able to be open to more than one interpretation or having a double meaning, just like our picture there. But ambiguous grief, being able to put a name on this, it is a loss without finality, which leaves us disoriented and not understanding the loss or how to move forward through it. Because with ambiguous grief, there's a lot of unanswered questions and there's a changed relationship. That's one of the keys to ambiguous grief. A relationship changes. Now, it can happen in a couple of different ways. Let me tell you the history of ambiguous grief. They started using this term during the Vietnam War. During the Vietnam War, we had an awful lot of our soldiers who were listed as MIA, missing in action. And we had families that had all this grief. But it was a very different type of grief than if you got the notice that your loved one was killed in action. Because missing in action, they're still alive. Are they alive? Are they dead? Are, are they a prisoner? Are, and there wasn't a name for what these families were feeling. And the term ambiguous grief, is, that's where the word comes from, ambiguous grief. And here are some of the other places where we might have a significant relationship loss, but they're still alive. A divorce, most definitely. That was not planned. Nobody gets married with the plan of getting a divorce. I hope they don't. And we lose that relationship, but that person is still alive. With mental health issues, we will find that as well. With addiction, with desertion, where somebody just walks away and we don't understand why. MIA is on there. Dementia is most definitely on there. And then that last bullet point, without a physical death, we can become consumed thinking that life might return to normal. They're going to get clean and sober and come back and everything's going to be just fine. I bet this isn't dementia. I am, this has to be something else and they're going to be okay this was not the plan. None of those things that are listed there was ever the plan. We do not have the closure that we might have in other situations. 
Another thing that comes along with ambiguous grief is that our loved one might do something or say something that embarrasses us. And those of you who has a, who have a loved one with dementia or if you work in the field know that sometimes their expressions, I'm really trying not to use the word behaviors anymore. I'm trying to switch that over. You heard Jamie talk about we're going to have a program about communication and behaviors or their expressions. They're doing the best they can with what they have left. But maybe their expressions are something that might embarrass us if they take their shirt off in the middle of church. They say something inappropriate to the waitress at the restaurant. But ambiguous grief can also feel like a personal failure because it can feel like I contributed to this in some way and we can blame ourselves and we can start wondering, was there something I could have done to prevent this? Maybe if I'd have seen the signs earlier, maybe if I wouldn't have been having that denial and we can actually freeze. We can become frozen in place. But this is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Talked about that all through the pandemic for the last two years. Because people would say, Holly, I'm feeling things I've never felt before and I'm very uncomfortable with it. And my response to that is, good. I'd be much more worried about you Again, if you were feeling completely normal during a time that wasn't normal. You're supposed to have feelings that aren't normal to you during a time that's not normal to you. You've got to let yourself have that. But because we're having those feelings, many times we won't share with other people. And then we don't get support. Because we're not sharing. Now, I've got some other examples on there where a parent's embarrassed that their child has become an addict or a wife is ashamed of her husband's affair. But this can also relate to dementia, where people are not sharing the diagnosis. Another part of ambiguous grief is not acknowledging the pain publicly, not sharing. Because when there is conventional grief, there's another term, conventional grief. Conventional grief is when somebody passes away. Conventional grief. And we know what to do. Those of you that are in Texas or in the South, you know what we're doing. Bring in the fried chicken. Here comes the food. We've got to bring the food because somebody has passed away. And we're flowers. We're going to show up with flowers. Uh, we're going to send a card. We know what to do with conventional grief. What do we do with this? That second bullet point says, after a death, we reorganize family roles and somebody takes over what the deceased used to do. But now we've got to do that and they're still alive. And either we have to take over their roles or we've got to get somebody else to take over their roles, but they're still very much alive. We talk about this a lot in our support groups and on that Saturday group, Last year, we actually started putting a list together, a list of roles. What are some roles that your loved one played that you're missing because it's gone now? And I want to show you that list. Here's some of the things that we came up with. I miss my friend. I miss my gardener. One of the wives said, I had no idea how to start that lawn mower, and now I'm out there having to figure out how to mow the grass because he took care of that. Or as an adult child, I miss my parent because now I'm the parent. They were my business partner. We made all our decisions together. I've never made decisions about money by myself. Or he was the mechanic. I don't know what to do when that light comes on the car. I miss not knowing what to do or who to turn to or where to go. My confidant. And that last one that I added on there, I thought was so powerful when a support group member said, he was my stabilizer in everything. Whether it was me reaching over and he was there in the bed and I knew everything was okay, or whether it was 
it's time to paint the house. What color are we going to paint the house? Or whether I'm making those decisions by myself now. So we grieve the list of those roles that they played. And like I said earlier, conventional death, a conventional grief, we all know somebody needs to step in and take the place and do those things. With dementia, so many times no one comes alongside and says, do you need me to mow your grass? Could I step in and fix your car for you? And we've got to figure out a way to fill those roles. So please hear, it's okay to not be okay while you're going through this. You've got to give yourself permission to go through this grief. Grieving is actually moving forward through feelings. You're moving. If you're grieving, you're moving. You're not stuck. You're moving. Another thing that comes along, that's why I chose this picture, is that feeling of being married but single. I am very much married. My loved one is alive, but I get invitations to things and I'm not going to RSVP for two anymore. Or people stop asking me to come because they don't know what to do or say. And we grieve that too. This is grief. So what can we do about it? You'll see on here a feelings wheel. And I am big on the feelings wheel because we tend to just talk about uh, feelings as in I'm sad, I'm mad, I'm happy. But there's so many more words that we could use. And in counseling, we have a term called if you can name it, you can tame it. You've got to be able to identify, first of all, that this is grief. And be able to say it, write it, admit it. I am feeling grief. I've even underlined a sentence there. If we can say these words, our relationship has changed. It is a real and permanent change. They are not going to snap out of it or come back like they were. We're owning it. When we say it or we write it, we own it. One of the things I love about a feelings wheel is you may be thinking to yourself, you know what, well, I'm just sad. But then you look at that feelings wheel and you go out from it and go, you know what I'm feeling today is actually remorseful. That's a better word for it. This is, I'm feeling remorseful today, wherever it is that I am right now, or I'm mad. Well, is it mad? Or you go out from it and you go, actually what's going on is um, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated because other people, if they hadn't been on this road, they don't understand. They don't get it. And so one of the things we've got to do is find support. Whether you get in a support group, and by the way, we have four of them here at the West Center. Three are online, one's in person. We'll send you information about that. Or you get with a counselor, a therapist, a, a minister, your friends. If you will talk to somebody who's ever been in a support group, especially a support group specific for families, and friends of those that have dementia, you'll find it is not a 12-step program. We don't go around and say, hello, my name is, and I'm A. But boy, is it a safe place to come and say, I'm having some feelings and thoughts that are a little bit scary to me, and I wonder if anybody else has ever felt this way. And you say it, and you, you see all these heads nodding. There's also a website called grieving.com. I've put it on there. That is a fantastic website to go to. We've got to take care of ourselves physically so that we don't become a statistic. Caregivers of those with dementia, 68% of the time, the spouse is going to die before the patient. 64% of the time, the adult child is going to die before their parent. Because we're putting them first and we're not taking our meds right and we're not going to the doctor. Or as I've had too many times, I'm cutting my pills in half because then I only have to go to the doctor every six months instead of every three. What are you cutting in half? My heart medicine, my blood pressure medicine. <laughs> this isn't just a statistic. I've lived it. I've watched it. I've stood at the funerals of caregivers. I've been the speaker at the funerals of caregivers. It's very, very real. 
being able to tap into a positive emotion. This is where you can do even an opposite action. I get up and I'm feeling this way, but I'm going to make myself go take that walk. And if when I get back from the walk, I'm still feeling this way, I'll allow myself to get back in the bed. But research and study shows us that about 60% of the time, we're not going to feel that way anymore. We're going to go, okay, I'm up. I might as well go ahead. And so we get through another day. Connecting with a higher power also. And we're going to talk about some research that's been done about having connections to a higher power and those that are taking care of people who have dementia. Another very healthy thing to do is to write a letter of release saying goodbye to the relationship the way that it was. You still have the relationship. You're always going to have the relationship. Even after that person has passed away, that love doesn't go away. But the relationship has changed. And if you can actually write a letter to the relationship the way it was, There's a practice and therapy called the empty chair where you talk to an empty chair and you talk to the person or you can actually talk to a relationship, talk to your marriage, talk to your um, the uh, parent-child relationship. I hate that our roles have reversed and say it to that chair. I'm a licensed therapist and I'm giving you permission to talk out loud and talk to yourself. It's very, very healthy for you to do. Now, what are you going to do with that letter? Some people keep them. Some people bury them. Some people burn them. Some people, if the person has passed away, will take them out to the cemetery and bury it out at the cemetery. Some people put them through the shredder. Some folks put them on a balloon and let them sail away. Do whatever feels right to you. And then building your resilience. And part of that is through uh, gratitude keeping a gratitude list. If you can think of three things that you did well during the day, especially if you do it at night, you know what you might have done well today? I brushed my teeth. That's it. That's as far as I got. I brushed my teeth today. I did a good job brushing my teeth. And that may be, have to be one of your things one day, but it's all right. You did it. I took my breath before I reacted to make sure that I responded. We've been talking about recently in the support group, sometimes the difference in a reaction and a response is one breath. Taking that breath. Ambiguous grief takes time. There is no timeline, but eventually that you will emotionally distance yourself from unanswered questions. And the further you go on this journey, sometimes those questions that you thought were so important in the beginning, they're not important anymore. And I recognize lots of faces and names on here. So I know your stories and I know that you're at the place where you're going. Yeah, that stuff that was important in the beginning. That's just not near as important as we travel on down the road of dementia. The only way to move forward is to feel those hard feelings and replace the need to understand with a commitment to move forward. Going through it rather than trying to go around it. Another way to move forward is to celebrate what remains and be open to a new type of relationship. Instead of focusing what's gone or what they can't do anymore, focus on what's left. So many times you may even have a silver lining where you find that you or that your loved one can do things. I didn't know they could draw. They never liked to draw before. Got a, a um, lady on our support group. She also has been part of that original group, just like Judy has. Just like Kathy's been part of it. Several of you that are on here. Her husband got to where he would draw the most beautiful and he could paint. He'd never done it before, but that right side of his brain was still intact. And so he was putting his emotions and his feelings out through art. And they discovered something together at the end of his life that they'd never known before. Focus on what remains. Understanding the illness isn't the person. In the big scheme of things, it's this much of their life. And it does not define them. And then you find meaning in the experience. You're developing a skill set you never wanted. None of us wanted this skill set. We didn't want to know how to do this, but you got it. 
are we going to do with it? When the person changes and as they change, our relationship changes as well, but it doesn't go away. It's not going to be easy. There's nothing about this that's going to be easy. But please remember that the person they are now does not take away from the person that they were. And it doesn't change the love that you have for them. Cherish those positive memories. Write them down if you can, because you're going to go back to them at some point. And you may end up doing something phenomenal, like our friend Kathy Goodwin, who's on the call with us right now, who's written a book about her experience, wrote an entire book about it. By looking back at journals and notes that she kept. Let's look at anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief is exactly that. Think about what that means, anticipatory. It's grieving that occurs prior to the actual loss. There's actually some benefits to anticipatory grief. We're going to look at those. It gives us time to have some closure. That's one of the things with dementia. We do have some time to maybe work through some issues that we may have had. It's very common also for the person who has a disease to go through anticipatory grief as well and grieve their own death. So again, most people are familiar with that term conventional grief because that's the grief that comes after a death. But again, we don't talk about anticipatory grief and when we don't talk about it, we don't get support for it. What does it look like? How is it different from conventional grief? Anticipatory grief statistically involves more anger. Let's think about why is that? Anger is the easiest emotion for most of us to feel. Okay, think about why. Why is that? Let's go back to when we were little children. Little, little children. We've all heard of the terrible twos. With my daughter, it wasn't the terrible twos. It was the horrible threes. Mercy. She wasn't in control of her emotions yet. She didn't have those skills. And so anger can come and they'll have tantrums. And some adults never really get control of their emotions. Or when we're under a tremendous amount of stress, we revert back to that. And the louder I get and the broader I get, and I might even lift my fist up, now I'm in control. Now you're listening to me. The very first support group that we did online right after the shutdown in March of 2020, the first person who came on was very, very angry. And it was an adult daughter and she was mad at the world and me and our center and anybody and everybody that she could think of. And I let her be angry and I let her say the things she was saying until those hard words turned into tears and we got down to it. And the next sentences were, what if by the time I get back in there, my dad doesn't know who I am? What if he dies during this? And I never, and that anger turned to fear. And the majority of the time at the root of anger is fear. Or afraid of something. At the bottom of this slide, uh, this came from verywellhealth.com. There's a study that said that 40% of women in a study said that they thought the anticipatory grief was actually worse than the post lost grief, worse than the conventional grief, because this goes on and on and on. So with anticipatory grief, we have physical, behavioral, psychological, social, and spiritual symptoms. We're going to look at some of those symptoms real quick. Of course, we're going to have sadness and tearfulness, and it can come on all of a sudden, just like we talked about earlier. One of the things with anticipatory grief, especially if we place our loved one, we've placed them in a facility, in a center that first time we go to the grocery store, this is a very real thing. I've always bought this type of cereal for my loved one. And we realize I don't need to buy that cereal anymore. 
and now I can't get out of the grocery store because I'm having a meltdown right here in aisle seven. There's a book called Good Grief that talks about uh, and actually brings some humor to uh, as we're going through grief, finding ourselves crying over those commercials. Fear, anger, and irritability. Again, fear being that e anger being that easiest emotion. Loneliness and depression. And resentment. Different types of resentment. Sometimes it's resentment at our other family members. Why aren't you here helping me? Why aren't you doing more? Or our church members. Where have you gone? I need you and you've walked away. But we're not telling them what we need. Sometimes we don't even know what we need yet. Other symptoms to anticipatory grief is anxiety. Now, hear what anxiety is. Anxiety is where we can kind of hang in the what ifs, the future. And we're keeping ourselves up at night with the, but what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, but if, oh. Depression, on the other hand, is when we can kind of get hung in the woulda, coulda, shouldas in the past. If only I would have. I should have. You find yourself. Uh, we talk shooting all over yourself. Don't should on yourself. You should all over yourself and you, boy, you can get stuck in depression. You may even find yourself getting hung up on something insignificant. I've shared this story before about the family member that brought the beautiful Christmas sweater for her mother because we're taking pictures with Santa. Mom did not want that Christmas sweater she wanted the yellow sweater with the stain that belonged to somebody else that she always wears. And daughter gets really mad. She's mad at me. She's mad at everybody because mom's not wearing the Christmas sweater. And I had to pull her aside and go, would you rather have a happy picture with your mom in the yellow sweater with the stain that's not hers, but she's comfortable in it or a really upset and mad picture with her in that pretty red sweater and what is this if this is our last Christmas and it was that particular family and she had to st stand back and think about it and boy do we love that picture of mom in the yellow sweater and the stain and happy 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 at her last Christmas getting hung up on insignificant things because I feel like I've got some control over those. We may also do something like a rehearsal of the person's death. We may visualize or even hear the phone call if they're placed. When we get that call, there's been a change in condition. You can feel guilty about it even, but it's a normal part. And it's a part of accepting the inevitability of, de of death, that it is going to happen. It's very normal to do that. You may have physical problems like difficulty sleeping. You may have memory issues yourself. Dementia is not contagious. You know that. Dementia is not contagious. But stress and depression can cause us to have memory issues. The fear of the loss about what is my future going to look like. But there's also benefits to anticipatory grief. It gives us a chance to have conversations that we might have missed out on. It gives us a chance to do some legacy building. It gives us time to forgive. And it gives us time to have quality time and make connections. And learn to meet them where they are in the disease and stop trying to bring them to our world. Go to theirs. We have that time to let go of some guilt and anger and to find closure we might have time to create a bucket list and to take some trips. Early on, we may be able to record some of their stories that at some point we're not going to hear anymore. And now we've got these phones that at any time we can pick it up and make a video of our loved one. Leaving a legacy that creates moments for the family and friends to enjoy later. And I encourage you with anticipatory grief to work through your unfinished business. At this point in my career, I've sat with over 300 people as they have passed away. It's a precious, precious time to get to do that. But too many times have I seen families come in and try to make peace 
with unfinished business at bedside of someone who's imminent. That isn't the time to do it. We're going to have uh, guilt and regrets. If we don't do it ahead of time. And you can do it well into the disease. You may have to sit with your mom or dad or husband or wife and ask for forgiveness. Or you know what else you might have to do? You might have to forgive them. And get to the point where we say, I know you did the best you could. Because we understand the circumstances. Wow, is it powerful to be able to do that before we're sitting bedside with them. Anticipatory grief in the patient. A person with dementia sometimes will do things. Now, everybody who's dying has something called a life review, but depending on what kind of dementia they have or where they are in the disease when they pass, I've seen some interesting things happen. One of them was I had a woman with vascular dementia actually ask me about three weeks before she died. She came in my office and said, do you have any regrets? Think about what she was saying. She wasn't asking me about mine. I responded back to her. I think we all do. Tell me about yours. She was doing a life review and she shared with me some things that her kids had not even heard. But I was safe. I didn't have the emotional attachment that the kids had. But being able to say, we're going to miss each other, aren't we? And hold our loved one and use those words. I'm going to miss you so much. And I know you'll miss me too. That second bullet point is powerful. We as caregivers are losing the one person in our life. But the person who's passing is losing all of their relationships at the same time. They're not just losing one. They're losing all of their relationships at the same time. Excuse me. So they're actually, the question comes up, does it help grieving later on? It does not take the place of conventional grief that happens afterwards. I had a precious family one time whose loved one had had dementia for 23 years. Now that's very, very unusual. And they would ask many times, they'd say those hard words, how long is this going to go on? Oh my goodness, I don't understand why. And as I sat with them, as he took those last few breaths, as he took his last breath, his wife turned to me and went, what do I do now? What, what now? I, I come every day at four. What am I going to do tomorrow? And she almost went into a panic attack. And she'd been preparing for this for a long time. But then it happened. So it's very different. Anticipatory grief is different from that conventional grief. I was with someone last year, I was in the room with her as her husband died, and she was holding him and I was holding her. And she turned around and looked at me and said, I thought I was ready. I thought I was ready. She can't ever be ready for that moment when they take that last breath. Now, a year out, she's able to say, I was so much more ready than I realized I was. I knew so much more because I'd educated myself. I'd been in the support groups. But none of us can pick the day. Because that's very common for families to say, I wasn't ready. This isn't a good day. And I've even held my calendar up before and said, can you find a better one? I'm honestly, is there a better day that this happened? There's not. So a few ways to cope with anticipatory grief. One of the things and again, I encourage you, if you don't write or you have never been one to write, to journal. I had a few men in the support group early on who just really, they weren't interested in it at all. And one in particular has been one to journal all the time. And he said something in the last year, his wife has passed away. And he said, I don't dream about her sick anymore. When I dream about her, she's well. When I dream about her, she's the woman that she always was. 
And for the longest time, all of his dreams, she was sick. But he'd been writing a lot, writing before bedtime. Spending, spending meaningful time with your loved ones, going through photos, telling stories, laughing, reminiscing, and crying together is okay too. Many people during anticipatory grief will try to do something about the loss. So they may try, I'm going to get another opinion. We're going to do non-traditional methods of medicine, and we're going to look for outside assistance because we can get very, very desperate, and we're going to try anything and everything. Another thing we can do is when we're trying to take control of our own reactions, we turn to sources like religion, spiritual consolation, and we make efforts to heal those estrangements, leaving legacies, selling estates, planning the funeral, doing life reviews, and being able to say goodbye. This is where we come in and we can nurture our spirituality, and it's different for everybody. For some people, that's going to be organized religion. For others, it may be prayer, meditation, being in nature, listening to meaningful music, but there is research that shows that people who are dying experience a better quality of life in the last days if they have an active spiritual life. And as someone who said, with all those people passing, I can tell you, I know that to be true because I have seen it over and over again. Please, again, get yourself into counseling or a support group. Talk to a minister. Talk to somebody that you trust. Uh, seek help from a mental health professional or from a grief therapist. Most churches have a pastoral counselor on staff that you can get with, or you can look specifically for somebody who specializes in grief. Now, here's that word complicated grief that I mentioned. Complicated grief happens when the usual responses to the death of a loved one do not fade over time and impair or prevent one from leading a normal life six months after the event. So if six months after someone has passed away, a person still cannot get up out of bed, cannot go to work, cannot get in the shower, then we've got something called complicated grief. And this is where we do, we need an intervention here. We need to step in and help somebody with this. But that's the only time there's a timeline. Now, does that mean in six months I'm supposed to? No, not at all. That's why I put it in bold. If it is impairing or preventing us from leading a normal life. If we're still getting up, we're going to work, but of course I'm still grieving. We might even have a day that I can't get out of bed. But we're talking about when it's every day and we're six months out. Giving our loved ones permission to die and practicing forgiveness, we've talked about that, and I put in bold there, resentment is a poison, you prepare for another, but you drink yourself. Got to be able to let go of resentment and hurt. The reality of dementia, they are both gone, but they are still here. You're taking care of them, you're taking care of yourself. You wish it was over, but you want them to keep living. Member of the support group recently said something that was so profound. She and her husband loved to um, bicycle and they had two bicycles and she knew he wasn't coming back home. So she took the two bicycles and she traded them in on a new one. And she said, I had to let go to start again. So I took our two bikes I traded it in on a new one for me, but she took something off of his old bicycle and put it on her new bicycle. And she said, now I carry him with me everywhere I go. Wow. Wow. That's healthy, healthy grieving. Now, things we've talked about. Ambiguous and anticipatory grief can be very difficult and exhausting, but we help ease the pain by acknowledging it in ourselves and in others. This is normal feelings that we're having, even though it can feel very abnormal. This isn't a normal time. Do not underestimate how you might be affected by this and give yourself permission to grieve at your own pace. Do not ever let anybody tell you when you should or shouldn't uh, be on. It's been six months ago. What do you think? Yes, it has. Thanks for reminding me of that time. You know, don't, don't, you don't have to be sarcastic. But you're never going to forget your sacred time you spent with someone as they transition from this life to the next. And it is a blessing to get to go on the journey. It is. 
And we get to the point where we look back and we don't say I had to do it. We say, I was able to do it. I got to do it. I encourage you to embrace grief and not to run from it. It'll help you and it'll help others as well as you go through it. And I do ask of you to become better and not bitter. We are going to stop right here and I'm going to ask Judy Locke to speak for just a moment. I know we're right at time. So I'm going to give her about five minutes to just talk about as a um, Judy, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Um, Jamie introduced her earlier. She was a family member um, here. She also, also is a chaplain and she's been a part of our support group since the very, very beginning. But I wanted her to speak about um, personally how anticipatory and ambiguous grief has affected her. And let me turn it over to Judy, if you would, please. Thank you, Holly. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. And I hope that by touching into my experience that I can give you some encouragement and hope. Um, I came to um, the role of being a care partner, caregiver, um, out of a family that was very, very private. So telling a story publicly about a member or members of my family was really not anything that was done. Um, and so um, I came to caregiving with that family message. Um, and then I came to caregiving uh, with the idea, and I honestly don't know where it came from, but that when I began to be the primary caregiver for my colleague and friend, Anne, um, that I needed to take her all alone, uh, the sole caregiver to the very end of her life. So when you start caregiving like that with those two messages about privacy and, and shame, we talk a lot about um, shame in, in group. Um, and the fact that I really shouldn't have asked for any help. It took me a long time to get to the place where I knew I needed help um, and that um, it was going to take me a while to learn what I needed to learn and maybe not ever. Um, I am really taken with the whole concept of ambiguous grief um, because I think it plays a huge role in our ability to see what we see with our loved ones and to respond or to learn how to respond. And, um, and I'm going to start with the words um, learning to play bingo. Uh, because they really they really apply in this case. Anne and I were were um, really uh, into playing board games, all kinds, especially word board games, but also um, you know Chinese um, what is it Chinese fire drill, you know with dominoes, anything. And um, so when she came to to a placement at James L West, she still could speak. Um, and she was so excited because they had bingo and that's one of her favorite games. And so she came to me and she said, you have to stay tonight this evening and they're going to play bingo. And as, as we set up the bingo, you know, and, and she got a place to sit and where she could see what I realized was that she wasn't playing bingo or bingo as I understood it. And initially I was really distressed because my background is education. So I think that I know how to teach people things. And something said to me, you don't need to teach her anything different than what she doesn't know, but how she believes that she knows how to play bingo because she was so full of excitement and delight and participating in a community. And I, it really carries the whole theme of what Holly talks about often. And that is that we don't bring our loved ones who have dementia to us. We go to them. And for the weeks that were left when she still had speech and still knew how to play bingo, she played bingo. She participated, you know, deeply in community life. Um, and it didn't have to be the kind of bingo that I was familiar with, but that I was with her we had a wonderful time with that experience. I think I had a better time than she did because I learned that I had to let go and to learn from her what it meant. Um, I think the same thing is very true with anticipatory grief. 
And that is while it's important for us to think about how will we handle that eventual loss of that individual or the, the passing of that individual, um, that we don't want to program either ourselves or our loved one for a particular anticipation of what might happen. Um, I think that it's important to have an opportunity, not at the last minute, but at a time when you can say what you need to say to your loved one. Um, and maybe to repeat that again, if there's time, but not to try at the moment of crisis to say what you want to say, to apologize, to express love and gratitude. Um, the other thing is that you need to do, whatever you need to do is to help ensure the comfort of your loved one. And you know, during that anticipatory grief time, I think we all need to look at what is it that I can postpone doing or saying uh, with my family members or with my loved one so that I don't create you know, more pain, more sorrow, um, more memories that, that are not healing for me. Uh, and then the last thing that I wrote down is you know, what are, what are our hopes about the death for this one we love? And for us, you know, as we anticipate that kind of letting go. I also want to say something very briefly about a term called ghosting. And actually, it's on uh, our list. And that is when it seems that people whom we thought would support us through the end of the life of our loved one somehow disappear, they leave us. Um, and how to gain some understanding of that. I had two very dear friends whom I absolutely was confident would go with Anne and me through the end of her life. And they, they chose not to. And so I had to deal with that loss too. And I think that's very important for us to understand that that can happen. And it doesn't mean that um, we've done something wrong or that our friends have done something wrong. Um, I think that this journey takes courage I think that it takes um, thought, but I think most of all, it takes the support of others. And that's been a really important part of my journey is to stop being the only person that can be the caregiver and to stop the individual who believed that she had to take her friend alone to the very end of her life. And so um, the, the support, the education, um, the counseling, the camaraderie that you can enjoy um, at James L. West, I think will make you stronger, will help you have a sense of community. We often talk among ourselves about having each other as companions on this journey, and it will help you find, you know, a sense of strength and hope that will take you um, where, uh, where God wants you to go. So I appreciate being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. That was very powerful what you said. And we hope that everybody really was able to take something that we wanted to try something a little bit different and, you know, have uh, Judy come in and, and just speak to us for these last few minutes. We appreciate everybody being here. Um, hope that you are able to take something from this. Again, you're getting the slides. I think Jamie already put them in the um chat but she will mail them to you with a copy of this recording if you ever have any questions if you want to talk more about this one-on-one -on -one, my email is on um, the slides and then you'll get that as well whenever Jamie sends everything out we appreciate you being here Jamie was there anything you wanted to add no just thank you so much Holly and thank you Judy for sharing your experience thank you we appreciate everybody bye-bye Bye-bye now.